I'm Mallory, a UX researcher at Google. Hey, I'm Emma, a software engineer at Google. We're going to talk to you about product inclusion and equity and walk you through some examples of inclusion and exclusion within software and hardware design. Inclusion and equity in tech is not the default. Traditional product development teams are not asked to critically examine the impact products have on historically marginalized communities. Currently, teams are incentivized to look at how solutions impact the average user, which first does not exist, and second, erases the needs of anyone who does not fall within the average. Black feminist scholar Patricia Hill Collins gives us a framework to think about how people experience and resist oppression within society at three levels, personal, community, and systemic. This framework was adapted to illustrate the relationship between power and technology by Sasha Costanza Chalk. Mallory and I are going to walk through examples at three levels to illustrate how exclusion and inclusion shows up in design in various ways and impacts real people. First, let's think about the personal level. This is how a design interface can affirm or deny a person's identity and invalidate their individual experience. One of the most common examples is through binary or restricted gender options and limited options for pronouns. These show up in many places that users cannot avoid before engaging in an app or product. Gender labels aren't just options in a drop-down menu. They are meaningful statements about your organization's understanding of gender and inclusion. They are usually one of the first indicators of whether a product or brand is intentional in fostering user trust, belonging, and safety. Here are a few unbranded examples of current onboarding profiles from prominent companies. A common issue is requiring users to answer sex assigned at birth. We have heard from trans, non-binary, and gender expansive communities that this does not always accurately represent their bodies or affirm their gender. In addition, these options do not include non-binary intersex users and refers to anyone who does not identify as male, female, as other, which can be invalidating and harmful. Language at the personal level does not only matter, it's critical to instill feelings of belonging and trust. This conversation is extremely nuanced and complex, and so we have linked additional resources and best practices from community experts. Next is the community level. Wearable tech defaults to being more bulky, heavier, and sized for larger wrists. Many with smaller wrists, people with mobility issues or nerve weakness do not find these characteristics approachable, comfortable or accessible. These are insights and considerations that went into the design of the Pixel Watch. The way a product is designed can elevate certain communities while suppressing or excluding others from participation. One example is how skin sensors were originally developed for wearable devices. Some skin sensors have issues under detecting on darker skin, as well as working accurately for people with tattoos, thicker or darker hair, and larger bodied people. This has been a central issue for wearables, where we see an opportunity for continuous investment to ensure that technology works equitably for all. And that's why it is so important to prioritize and center the most marginalized communities in the development process. These issues can further reproduce social systems, for example, fitness tracking can now be used to lower insurance premiums, and that can create barriers for certain communities by causing higher premiums or a lack of benefits. And this is an example of how a community level issue can become a systemic one. This leads to our final topic, the systemic level. The way products are designed can reproduce or challenge social hierarchies and systems. For example, voice assistants are either exclusively female or highly feminized by design which then reinforces gender stereotypes and roles. In contrast, chatbots, typically in roles such as law or finance, are almost entirely masculine voices. This reinforces gender stereotyping in the workplace, as women are disproportionately overrepresented in lower level secretarial roles and men in leadership and authoritative roles. These stereotypes continue to reproduce social hierarchies. We need to ask ourselves, do we want to replicate the status quo or do we want to create new, more just worlds within the technology we build? While there is still a long way to go, there are many companies who have been making great strides to create products that more accurately represent the diverse and ever-evolving world we live in. For example, some financial institutions allow people to add their preferred names and titles to their payment cards instead of their legal ones. We have also seen some ride-sharing apps develop a suite of safety tools for women and non-binary people. And here at Google, we've been combating bias in products such as camera technology and speech recognition. Product inclusion and equity 
is a journey that takes critical analysis, time, and investment. It's important to acknowledge the power technology has in challenging bias at the personal level, barriers at the community level, and reproducing systems many of us are actively fighting to combat. There is still so much more work to be done to ensure products we build are equitable and valuable for all people. To continue to learn about product inclusion and equity and Google's efforts, check out Belonging at Google. We have linked to numerous resources that can help you start your journey when designing an inclusive smartwatch app. Thank you for listening. Thank you.